Good afternoon to those of you who are in Europe and in, in the Middle East, and a good morning if you are in the US, and welcome back uh, to the second session of the INIRE and FSHIRE uh, online meetings on religion and the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, as you can see from the screen, uh, this afternoon we will hear Christian, Jewish and Muslim voices uh, reflecting on how different faiths responded uh, to the pandemic. Um, just a couple of things before we start and ending over to Professor Meloni, who will moderate the session uh, today. Uh, we would like to take at least one question uh, from the audience after each contribution. So as we uh, only have one hour and a half to spend together, I uh, would ask speakers to stick as much as possible to the timing, which is eight minutes for each contribution. And uh, also ask participants to leave their questions in the chat and uh, raise their hands to ask for the floor. Um, uh, also, um, to avoid any difficulties and keep the discussion small, uh, I think it's best if I do not intervene on your mics today as I did yesterday. So please uh, mute yourselves and unmute your mics when, you, when it's your turn to speak. Thank you. Professor Meloni, the floor is yours. Good. Thank you very much. Welcome again. Uh, we are sorry to not welcome you in uh, Palermo, at least for this uh, year. Next year will come very soon, more or less one year, everybody says. And uh, we will see if it will be possible to meet in person in uh, a so uh, important context for uh, multi-religious um, cohabitation in uh, the Mediterranean Sea and in, uh, and in the world. <clears throat> the purpose of uh, the present uh, uh, discussion is to uh, try to see what is the reaction of uh, different religious families uh, to the COVID uh, crisis. And uh, we will have uh, uh, a perspective from uh, Islamic uh, theology, from Jewish uh, theology, and also a perspective on a philosophic uh, approach from a Western point of view and the Western uh, European uh, Christianity. Uh, I'm very grateful to the speakers who accepted to be here. I'm personally very grateful to Imam uh, Yaya Pallavicini, uh, who is a good uh, friend, he is the president uh, of uh, the organization of uh, Italian Muslim uh, faithful and also scholars. And uh, we have an intense uh, cooperation since uh, an awful uh, lot of years uh, before with his uh, uh, father, whose uh, personality was a blessing for this country for interreligious uh, dialogue, and also now with uh, him and his uh, fellows and uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, friends and brothers and sisters. <clears throat> so the beginning of this uh, meeting is uh, uh, on my shoulder only because of something that in Italian we call uno scherzo da prete, a joke made by the priest. I don't know if there is something rabbinic that can be parallel, but I suppose that this will, it must exist uh, one way or another. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was the Archbishop of Palermo uh, Corrado Lorefice, who was supposed to give this uh, address, but uh, uh, today is Santa Rosalia in uh, Palermo, uh, the most important uh, liturgical celebration of this young uh, woman uh, who went to live uh, in the mountains around Palermo after the pestilence of 1624, and uh, she became a very venerated ascetic uh, figure. And uh, after this, uh, she became uh, the most important uh, uh, protagonist of liturgical life of, uh, of the city. So today for uh, Archbishop Lorefice is a very forbidden uh, day for doing something else that uh, uh, celebrating the, the La Santuzza, as they called her in, uh, in, in, in the city. So it was up to me uh, to tell you something about uh, Catholicism and virtual space. And I will try to give a good uh, example, keeping very strictly uh, the time that I have uh, at my disposal that is a bit less than your uh, time. Uh, first of all, uh, 
the, the, the narrative of uh, pestilence in this time of uh, COVID is not very different from the other uh, narrative of pestilence that we can find in, uh, in uh, history, uh, namely the, the sense that there is something wrong, that the pestilence is showing, if not punishing, and there is something good that the pestilence is uh, showing, if not urging us to reach it. And uh, the difference is that this is now happening into uh, a, a situation and a, and a technical context that is the context of the social media and of the worldwide uh, web. That for Catholicism is a very complicated and difficult, dangerous situation uh, because it takes one of the most interesting uh, prerogatives of Roman Catholicism in uh, the family of Western Christianity and uh, uh, make of it a very central point. Uh, if you wanted to describe in a very short time, uh, in a very short time, uh, the competition between ecclesiological views in Roman Catholicism, uh, you may say that there is uh, a view uh, that is called uh, universalism that is thinking to uh, Christianity as a sort of universal family with local specification. It is not from today that it comes, it comes from Platonic and the Neoplatonic uh, ecclesiological foundations of uh, the Christianity itself. It comes from Philo of Alexandria and from uh, a Jewish idea migrated into the Christian uh, theology, namely, as there is the increated Torah uh, beside God at the beginning of the worlds, uh, there is also the universal church that uh, God thought at the very beginning uh, of uh, time and creation. And so this idea of the universal church is uh, there from the very beginning, and the local churches are only uh, the specification of uh, this universal uh, idea. This, as I said, comes from the patristic uh, era and goes uh, up to now. Uh, Josef Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, was one of those who thinks uh, that the universal church pre-exists the local churches. And you have another ecclesiology, made exactly the other way around, saying that the local churches, namely the real places in which people are celebrating the Eucharist, are pre-existing the universal church. The local churches are there and the universal church is made by the convergence, uh, the conspiratio, as said uh, Nicola Cusano. Uh, the universal church comes simply from uh, this uh, aspect. On a certain, to a certain extent, uh, the very idea of the Roman papacy had been grounded into a universalistic approach. Uh, making of uh, the Bishop of Rome, not simply the Bishop of Rome that is because of this the head of a movement of unity, but uh, uh, it is a universal CEO of uh, the Catholic uh, Church, uh, thought as a sort of big universal global company. And uh, to go into the web during uh, the COVID crisis, has shown exactly the contradiction between these two uh, approaches. On one side, you had the effort, sometimes the pathetic effort, of local priests and local bishops to exist in the world wild mess that is the web, uh, filling the air and the webinar uh, with uh, stupid homilies, uh, useless sermons, and very banal consideration on spirituality, uh, COVID, illness, death, and so the, the entire repertorium of uh, what is uh, uh, the religious stupidity uh, shared uh, by the almighty in equal part among all the human beings. Uh, but uh, on the other side, because of COVID, you had this experience that was represented in a very dense sense by the prayer of the uh, Holy Father alone in the square of St. Peter, uh, when uh, uh, this celebration showed also that what is called in Latin the Papa Solus, the Pope alone, uh, had a sort of self-destroying element. 
uh, in the Latin ecclesiology, the idea of what is in the power of the Papa Solus, of uh, the Pope alone, is a typical intransigent argument concerning uh, the papacy and its uh, powers. And on the contrary, COVID showed that the Papa Solus is uh, simply alone, is not uh, a sort of uh, universalistic uh, power speaking to uh, thousands and billions of people, but is a real solitude in which even the Pope is unable to reach uh, the flock and uh, to create a real state of uh, interplay and communion with uh, the people he is uh, living uh, with. And so the COVID crisis is for the Roman Catholicism to a certain extent a challenge and also a joke if you want, because he had taken one of the fundamental arguments of the Roman Catholic ecclesiology and the Roman uh, Catholic uh, um, theology of the Pope or papolatry, as somebody called it, and showed the contradiction that is in itself. Uh, that is in itself. On the other side, this is my last uh, word, there is a problem that I think we will discuss in the next few uh, moments, namely uh, the sense that in this crisis uh, there has been a sort of uh, uh, unexpected compliance of the religious communities to the worst representation that they may suffer from outside, namely the request to show how useful they are, not what they are capable to do, what, not what they are actually doing, not the reasons because they are doing something, but simply to be, uh, to prove themselves useful and uh, positively useful for another benefit that is, uh, so that is uh, the economic uh, 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 resistance and resilience to, to the crisis. One point is my last word. Everybody understand that that is very different to say that I have to keep a good distance from Irene because Irene can be a danger for me or that I have to keep a good distance from Irene because I can be a danger for her. And so this simply a reversal of uh, compassion and fear is a very theological argument, but if you can correct me, I'm happy of being corrected in that. I don't have any record of a representation of the social distancing as a way of expressing uh, love and care for the other instead of love and care for the cells. So this is my short introduction, and uh, I've kept it in my minutes, if you're in uh, may confirm it, and so uh, we are ready to start with the most important aspect and uh, papers of our uh, afternoon. So my, my role now is to leave the floor to uh, Abdullah Antepli, uh, who served at, at Duke University as the first Muslim chaplain from 2008 to 2014 and uh, Duke's chief representative of Muslim Affairs engages students, faculty and staff across and beyond campus through seminar panels and other avenues to provide a Muslim voice and to the discussion of faith. Uh, he was also the director of the Duke Islamic Studies Center uh, from 2004 to 2015 and in 2019, Imam Antepli joined the Sanford School of Public Policy as Associate Professor of the Practice with a secondary appointment of the Divinity School as Associate Professor of Practice of Interfaith Relations. So, Imam Antepli, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Alberto, for this wonderful opening. Uh, good morning to people on my time zone and good afternoon to everybody there. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, like everybody, I have, uh, I'm so happy to be here with you, but the whole plan was we were going to get some suntan in Palermo, and I was going to be um, uh, connecting to that southern uh, Italy, which has very long, deep, and somewhat complicated history with Islam, Muslims. I was really excited, but uh, as we say both in Hebrew and Arabic, apparently, men make plans and God smiles. 
I hope uh, we can realize those plans some other time. And looking forward to inshallah being in, this, in a beautiful country of Italy, especially I was so excited to meet a fellow Imam and Muslim, Imam Yahya, after hearing so much of his good work and amazing leadership there. I hope there will be a possibility, inshallah, God willing, in the future. In these brief eight minutes, um, I have been given the task to reflect on what visions, what possibilities, religion and religious communities, faith and faith communities can provide to this post-corona, post-pandemic world uh, but I would like to add, the, as the only U.S. Uh, presenter here, um, uh, the, the kind of uh, post-effect, um, something that's been rocking our world here in the United States, the uh, recent protests on racial matters, Black Lives Matters, it, it became almost an equal size magnitude earthquake. A pandemic changed our lives and turned it upside down. And Black Lives Matter uh, equally really change the conversation and they are two related. I would like to incorporate um, that upheaval uh, into my reflections of what religion and religious communities can provide in this, in this. And I have three. I hope we can add more. I think what religion and religious communities, if there is any use for them in this extraordinary moment, um, one of the ways in which religions can activate its institutions, its ethical moral teaching mechanisms, uh, is to reflect on the pandemic and the racial tension here in the United States with a call for accountability, with a call for, as my Jewish brothers and sisters always do on Yom Kippur, with a little bit of chest beating, because the current picture of pandemic and this existence global crisis shows that we arrived here as a global community and we have to really uh, assess and audit our global economic system, social system, political system. Uh, it requires some sense of examining uh, our lives uh, altogether. And religions are nothing but uh, aspire to be that source of uh, accountability, that voice of moral, that voice of reason asking people to slow down and reflect and audit their lives, their individual lives, their collective lives. Um, but before I, before I sort of uh, expand on this point, first I will uh, take a self-critical role. Religions can take this mission and abuse it. As my Quran teacher in the madrasa used to say, the bad imam, bad clergy is the one who makes people guilty for no reason. And I think in every religion and religious communities, uh, it is embedded trap and a moral flaw to make people guilty for no reason. Or uh, in, our, in an attempt to uh, point out people's individual and collective mistakes, portray a monstrous image of God, uh, or uh, the draw God as, a, as an image of a fire-breathing dragon. And there are so many of those regretful voices in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism in this pandemic moment, looking at this global disaster and saying, aha, God is angry. It's because of your sins. It's because of this and because of that, that this is happening, etc. It is, it is really, I detest, I am disgusted by those religious voices using miseries, calamities, and disasters to make people guilty for no reason, because that freezes people. It doesn't really solve any problem. In the word of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in order to explain how merciful God is, um, he was sitting on a rooftop overseeing a bazaar, and he points out a woman desperately looking for her lost child. She lost her son and in the bazaar, going desperately looking for her child. And as Prophet and his companions watching the scene, she finally finds her and embraces her in tears. And Prophet Muhammad says, do you think this woman will ever throw this child into a hellfire, will burn her child? And the companions say, of course not. And the Prophet famously says, God's mercy, attachment, connection, uh, to human beings or God's creation is 
much, much greater, much bigger than this woman's mercy and compassion to her child. Her child made a mistake and got lost. And her return to her mother was not fear of further punishment, further intimidation, further yelling, further slapping. That's called abusive parents. So religions can play a role in inviting failed and lost human beings go back to their parents, go back to the loving, caring teachings of their faith tradition, to re-examine themselves. We lost our way. That's why we are here. This pandemic shows us that our economic, social, political, cultural systems are not working. Um, in order to really examine this without, again, pumping unnecessary amount of shame and guilt into people, I would like to discuss with the people here who are much more knowledgeable than me, how can religions be that critical voice? How can we invite people for accountability? How can we invite people for re-examination? How, how can we make people beat their chest, not the chest of the neighbor on the next side, how can Jews can beat their own chest, not just beating the chest of the Jew, Christians and the Muslims? How can we create a religious language of examination? Accountability is one area. I believe when it's done well, religions can play a significant role in this. Secondly, and I think Black Lives Matter and the racial tension shows, the, the pandemic and the crisis gives us an incredible opportunity, religious or not religious, to find out how to develop empathy. A famous a Sufi, Nasreddin Hoja of the Middle East, once he falls down from the roof, and when he's in pain on his butt, uh, his wife and his children, his disciples rush to him and say, shall we call a doctor? Shall we take you to a hospital? And he says no to all these uh, helps and says, take me to people who fell down from the roof. Because the moral responsibility is when you hit with a calamity to develop an empathy and solidarity with people who have been going through these calamities and disasters over and over. Now you are experiencing this. Now you are confined with social isolation. Now you can't travel. Now you can't go to beautiful Palermo. As you first time tasting this pandemic and limitations and restrictions, your first moral responsibility, which religion, again, in a post-corona world, says for this, this disasters or pain that you are enduring is a way of life for so many people around the world. People are suffocating. People are left behind. People have been locked down. People have no space. M many Muslims are now crying that they cannot go to Juma prayer at the mosque because mosques are closed. There are so many people because of who they are, because of living in war conditions, going and finding a space in a faith community is not an option, but a way of life for them. So how to develop a religious language of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism that we can actually develop a respectful language of empathy, solidarity with people who have been going through this. Father Alberto is playing around and practicing his uh, IT skills. That's wonderful. The second, in addition to accountability and self-examination, Toba uh, asking for atonement, uh, how to use that religious language. The second thing is, how to develop empathy, solidarity, and solution is my second one. And the third one, I'm running out of time, is I think religions are at best in looking at the world of seen and connecting it to the world of unseen. Religions are decoding mechanisms in one way or another in communicating the world to come or world to be seen, the spiritual metaphysical world, into the world of physical world that we see. What we have seen through Corona and what we are seeing through these Black Lives Matter protests is nothing short of burning bush miracles or these extraordinary events that our foundational texts are teaching us in our Quran, Bible, and Torah, and more. I think the religions have to not only solve problems, 
but also look what an incredible opportunity this COVID pandemic, this extraordinary measures turn our lives upside down. Moses in the Quran, when he sees the burning bush in distance, while he was traveling with his family in the desert, he famously says in the Quran, wait here, let me go and find out what this extraordinary fire is about. Maybe there are wisdoms and teachings in them that I can tell to my people when I go to the children of Israel. So can we step back, use religious languages, language of spirituality, language of metaphysics, to look to see maybe through this, God is telling us a different kind of story. Maybe there is a way in which our religious ingenuity, entrepreneurial spirit, we can make things differently. We can relate to God differently. We can invite God's presence into our lives differently is the third vision that religion can put it. Famously, another Sufi Rumi says, when life brings you into your knees, when the conditions and realities around you forces to your knees, that's the best position to pray. So as the corona and the racial tensions have brought us to this physical form, what's the best prayer to do? What is this position telling us? What this picture is supposed to mean in our quest, in our aspirations to relate to the transcendent and bring that reality to the world that we live in? So these are three uh, visions I'm hoping religious faith and religious communities without cheap shots and unnecessary guilt calling humanity into self-examination and then developing empathy to those we have not seen until now. The pandemic and the racial tensions are uh, removing the veils from our eyes and using the miracle language of splitting the Red Sea, the burning bush, whatever. All those teachings can we apply to Corona and this upheaval in our world today? I think we can. I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation with all of Please. you. I will pause here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry to interrupt uh, you, but uh, the rule of the six uh, of the eight minutes uh, is very strict. And so now we have uh, uh, time for one question uh, because uh, Hilda decided that it's better to have uh, one question than no question. Uh, this is a very important democratic position. And so the floor is to, to you for one, uh, uh, for one question and then uh, we will move to the second uh, to the second speaker. Hilda, please. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Imam and uh, Antelpi, for this inspiring talk. And uh, I was actually um, excited to hear it. It's it's um, it's refreshing, I think. Too many religious voices aren't speaking in this language. And uh, so it, it's great to hear it. And I want to take it and ask you in a similar vein, but slightly different. Many people said that the pandemic made, uh, made it obvious that nationalism has to be back and rabid nationalism rather. But I would say that the pandemic showed us how very lonely we are in our own homes. Where should religion come in here? Into in this. Well, what, what would you say would religion say? Is it, is it more, is it a, a sign that we have to be more um, communal? Do we ha should we fight against this loneliness in the sense of being more communal, being more, uh, in, uh, more um, aware of ours, our own people? Or perhaps we should uh, be happy with just ourselves in our homes, being more individual. Excellent, excellent question, Hilda. And thank you for your kind and gracious words. I already exceeded my time, so I will be very brief. I think the question, the phenomenal, wonderful question you asked is answered about 2000 years ago by Rabbi Hilla. I think, uh, I don't wanna just simplistically say all of the above. Rabbi Hilla famously says, if I am not for myself, who will be? I think self-preservation, which pandemic requires us, 
our connection to ourselves, our tribe, our nation is essential. And it's a moral value. There is nothing good or moral about suiciding or putting yourself out there and neglecting yourself. That's the sin. In Islamic tradition, if you neglect to brush your teeth and if your teeth goes wrong, that's a trust from God that you sin. So I think there is nothing wrong about the positive aspect of uh, taking care of yourself uh, and being selfish when it's necessary and protecting yourself. But Rabbi Hillel doesn't stop there. And Rabbi Hillel, in his ancient wisdom, which is also, I think, continued in Christianity and Islam afterwards, if I'm only for myself, if I am only for myself, like that, I think you, you fill in the blank in every language. What kind of a picture uh, it presents about who you are, what your religion is about, and how much moral integrity you have. And uh, uh, he famously continues to say, if not now, when? I think we have to, it's not being bipolar, it's not being, but I think religions are at its best, again, holding contradictions, seemingly contradictory truth claims and realities together. I think we have to find out a way how we can religion make work which doesn't neglect or uh, destroy our self uh, preserv preservation, but at the same time activates that level of empathy, solidarity that I try to explain about others. I think this is incredibly important and it's time to act. I think in this crisis, uh, I will end it with this note, not to be so alarmist. As you know, religion is declining in many parts of the developing world. If religion cannot provide a meaningful solution, if it remains very parochial and always guilt pumping mechanism, it will be a huge blow uh, to this ancient trust that we have been holding in our traditions, and it will be very regretful. This is our time to shine. We should be thriving and revealing the best of our theologies in promoting self-preservation in a kosher and halal way, not exceeding it, not becoming a narcissistic megalomaniac, and, and promoting taking care of the others, but also empowering people to act now. Good. So thank you. The counter is uh, working, and now for me is the, the time to give uh, the floor uh, to Yaya Sergio, Yaya Palavicini, who, as I said, is, uh, is not only a good friend, but mostly he is one of the most prominent person in uh, the religious life of Italian Muslims and the European relation with the Muslim uh, world. Uh, he is uh, beside his role in the Koreis, the Islamic religious community in uh, Italy. Uh, he is the chairman of the ESESCO Council for Education and Culture in uh, the West, uh, serving as advisor at the Minister of Interior Affairs and also Imam of the Hawahid Mosque in uh, Milan. And so for me, it's a great pleasure to give to him uh, the floor. Prego, Yaya. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, thanks uh, to Professor Alberto Melloni and uh, to Irene for this kind invitation and for the excellent organization of this uh, uh, webinar uh, on a, such an actual and important uh, subject. I, I greet uh, my brother uh, Abdallah, uh, with whom we share the Transatlantic Concordia Forum, and also Rabbi Shabtai, I hope to listen and learn from your knowledge. Uh, shalom. Uh, uh, to go to the points uh, uh, as a second uh, Muslim speaker, and of course acknowledging uh, uh, all the, what has been mentioned already now from uh, my brother Abdallah, I would go uh, uh, methodologically on a few points uh, and comments uh, on each point uh, that this pandemic uh, crisis, uh, according to the Muslim uh, uh, Islamic uh, situation uh, worldwide, has affected. Uh, uh, so, for instance, uh, uh, maybe uh, a, a prejudice uh, on uh, Islamic uh, engagement uh, in this uh, health emergency would have been uh, that uh, the Muslims would react uh, or act uh, in a different way 
in terms of uh, the, you, the um, World Health Organization standards uh, on the crisis. Uh, I think in some terms there was this uh, uh, prejudice, uh, but on, in, in this term, this was completely uh, cancelled because uh, worldwide the Muslim institutions, the Muslim scholars, theologians and jurists, and even the uh, believers uh, have sticked to the priority that uh, we have to be safe and, we, and health uh, is a priority not only for ourselves, our community, but for humanity. So there was no discussion in terms of interpretation on the priorities. Uh, now, having said that, uh, I, I think that there were some situations where maybe on one side or the other, there were some interpretations that might be interesting to study or to comment uh, uh, positively or negatively. Uh, for instance, uh, in terms of a positive reaction, according to my vision, uh, the ancient uh, habit uh, of addressing the call for prayer for the minarets uh, uh, from the mosques, uh, uh, inviting Muslims to pray, but to pray at home, was in somehow uh, represented after centuries. And in the Muslim world, in Asia, in Africa, but even in the West, uh, this was quite symbolic uh, to hear the call for prayer with a changement in the phrase, uh, inviting Muslims to pray at home and not to come to the mosques. And I think this was something quite interesting. On the other side, if I may say, I was uh, asked by the Muslim World League uh, to comment on the closing of uh, Mecca, the, which, as you know, is the spiritual center for Muslims worldwide, as a point of reference uh, symbolically for the prayer, for the five daily prayers for all Muslims, uh, but also as a, po as a place uh, uh, to go at least once uh, uh, in your life for pilgrimage. And uh, I think that the uh, Saudi institutions were in somehow uh, sensitive to have a worldwide consensus on this closing of Mecca to any kind of visits and, pil and pilgrims for, of course, the priority once again of healthcare. Uh, nevertheless, uh, my comment was not so positive because uh, uh, we, uh, I think uh, uh, religious authorities and believers need to somehow frame the balance between priorities, which means that, of course, uh, 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 we have to stress the health care uh, and the emergency at a global level, but we cannot uh, uh, in somehow forget our religious duties. And so uh, uh, what is asked uh, is actually to find solutions that can somehow balance and uh, um, uh, have the health priority, but also continue the symbolic ritual that needs to be performed in Mecca since 14 centuries. So it's, all, it's, also, it's also a question of wisdom and uh, practicality. And this is what is needed. And, uh, and actually, after uh, some weeks uh, uh, of discussion, although they closed for some weeks uh, uh, any kind of entry to the holy place of Mecca, they finally allowed delegations to continue to perform their prayer with a distance uh, uh, in uh, Mecca. And so symbolically, this ritual has continued uh, since then and is still going on now. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because uh, we, one uh, measure, one security measure cannot substitute uh, another religious priority. We have to try to find, if I may uh, say, how to manage uh, our religious duties in the context of a new crisis or of health emergency. Uh, one thing does not substitute the other. To, to, if I may say, confirm this, um, this uh, proposal, uh, I would go to another uh, concrete fact, which was um, in Europe and in Italy, uh, uh, the, the proposal by the European secular Italian government to have as a priority for citizens uh, business and commercial uh, reopening of uh, 
uh, uh, of activities. And uh, our position in Italy to, to the government and in Europe uh, was that uh, once again, we, have, we cannot substitute the priority of business and commercial and trade uh, in society and in institutional agendas neglecting uh, the freedom of religion of the same citizens of any community. So the, the, the challenge is to face together brotherly as uh, responsible citizens, uh, the priority of emergency in health, but on the other side, try to find solutions on how to be consistent with our religious duties in the context of this crisis. And uh, if uh, the government uh, uh, decides that uh, the health situation has changed and uh, uh, um, shops and commercial parks uh, can open again, then uh, my point was, uh, I think we should also open synagogues, uh, churches and mosques as well with the same security measures for believers in order to help them uh, help them buy uh, or, or, or go for shopping, but in the same time go for prayer and gathering uh, with the same security measures. And this was uh, eventually a successful debate because together with the Jewish and the Christian and the Buddhist and the Hindu uh, communities in Italy, we finally signed an agreement which was actually a very interesting moment because it was at the very last week of Ramadan. So uh, eventually some of the mosques uh, that were consistent with the security measures uh, could host uh, their believers the last week of Ramadan in Italy, finding the, two, the, the new way of combining uh, uh, priorities uh, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, health security, but also in terms of uh, uh, religious practice. Uh, my last points uh, would be the question of another uh, pillar of Islamic worship, which was which which not um, fasting and prayer I have mentioned already, which is almsgiving. This is quite an interesting situation because this gave us uh, in Italy the occasion to in somehow, as Professor Meloni was mentioning, in somehow be consistent with the natural uh, solidarity in helping each other, not only ourselves, but finding through a, a new uh, development of brotherhood, the way to help poor and needy families in Italy, in Europe and worldwide. And this uh, situation is quite developing in terms of economic development because uh, on one side I have been uh, honored to somehow draft together with uh, Prince Hassan of Jordan uh, an international initiative where the almsgiving uh, should be somehow uh, addressed from the uh, wealthy Muslims to all families and situations where the needy are, have been affected by the crisis. Uh, and on the other side, we are discussing with the civil society uh, C20, how to find guidelines uh, to somehow inspire the next G20 in, uh, in uh, Riyadh on uh, uh, measures on the crisis and how to implement in somehow international interreligious ethical uh, uh, sensitivity in terms of development and in terms of uh, helping uh, uh, humanity or the part of humanity that has been affected. Uh, the last point, uh, which is unfortunately the most uh, urgent, uh, at least in Italy, is the educational gap. Because uh, in some time, in somehow, these uh, distance online uh, uh, conferences and teachings uh, are helping practically uh, students and young uh, persons uh, in their homes, but the lack of a direct uh, contact with teachers and the lack of skill and experience of some of the Muslim students in schools in Italy is actually creating an educational crisis because uh, uh, they have no, not, not, not the same level of language expertise. And this uh, methodology of technological 
uh, a distance uh, learning uh, is somehow not uh, sufficient to help many of, uh, if I may say, the second generation Muslims in Italy, especially coming from Bangladesh or Pakistan, uh, to uh, catch up with the gap of uh, uh, trying to learn. And this same situation might be uh, negative in terms of a increasing prejudice and discrimination towards migrants in uh, the south of uh, Europe. Because uh, already we had a prejudice and a discrimination for migrants. Uh, and uh, now uh, we, we, the, the, there is a danger that uh, uh, a narrative against uh, uh, cultural differences or religious minorities might increase uh, in terms of confusing uh, the migrant issue with uh, the health uh, crisis, uh, with uh, the Muslim uh, uh, radical uh, ideological interpretations. So there is time and uh, occasion for a, a very important educational uh, reaction and coordination, I think. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yaya. Again, uh, we have one minute for questions. Uh, if uh, uh, you want to take the floor. So I will take only one, one second. Oh no, there is in, in, the, in the chat that there is a question. Uh, yeah, if you look to the to the chat, uh, you will see the question from from uh, Abdeslam Gawi, Professor Duke. I think Sohar Maor has requested. Uh, I don't know him. Uh, is that what you're mentioning? I see the the hand raised from Zohar Maor. Yes, yeah. you can you can uh, you can answer Sorry. first, uh, Abdeslam. Uh, question and uh, if there will be still time you can answer mine so uh, salam asks across muslim countries religious voices and authorities to quebec seat while political security authorities are playing a major role how significant is this change well according to my vision unfortunately it is not so significant because uh, uh, i think there is uh, in terms of uh, my experience uh, quite a strong intellectual crisis among the Muslim leaders uh, in contemporary uh, society. So uh, actually their choice, uh, uh, politically speaking, is uh, mostly to try to find uh, a, um, a cooperation with uh, secular institutions uh, uh, rather than play the theological role of trying to uh, reframe and renew a spiritual interpretation of certain signs in contemporary history. Uh, so uh, there is a there is a, 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 a verses from the Quran that says that uh, on one side there are signs that God gives us. Uh, are we able to uh, change our vision and our action accordingly? Uh, uh, in somehow reframing and uh, renewing the spiritual uh, interpretation of, the, of certain signs. I'm afraid that the theological and spiritual uh, explanation uh, of certain signs uh, is you know, unfortunately very poor, intellectually speaking, and uh, the priority goes mostly to pragmatic or so-called political uh, uh, agreements. Uh, I, I hope I, I answered uh, well to the question. Thank you very much. Uh, Zor, do you want to? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, in Israel, the synagogues were, like in Italy, closed and then reopened uh, under several uh, limitations. And uh, many people saw that uh, many of the uh, uh, people that used to go to synagogues and now pr prayed for some time in their private homes alone or in some uh, more uh, intimate uh, uh, minyanim groups uh, with the neighbors, they, they, they didn't come. 
and many people are, wor are worried if uh, if uh, the the worship houses after the end of uh, this pandemic will be less crowded. What do you think about it from your perspective? Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, two short uh, answers. Uh, on one side, uh, my dear colleague and friend, the chief rabbi of Milan, uh, uh, Rabbi um, Arbib, uh, he mentioned me, which is quite interesting, that there is an increasing interest on religious studies of Torah from the Jewish students, which is quite the, sim the same situation for myself, who concerns Islamic studies online. Now, our common issue is that uh, although there is an increasing interest, uh, because it's easier to, uh, to follow some courses uh, online, how, how influential will these studies be uh, in the lives of uh, our common citizens and, and, and new generations of uh, Jews and Muslims and Christians in, in, in Italy? Because the problem is that uh, we, we have no idea on the real impact of these kind of, uh, of means uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, influencing heart and minds. And the same situation is in some, uh, somehow what concerns your question on uh, if there is, uh, I must, I must witness that in our mosques uh, there is an increasing number. We have to uh, double or, uh, or at least the um, sessions for Friday prayers because we have uh, queues uh, out of the mosque uh, trying to uh, come for one uh, session or for the other, as we as we needed to have a distancing of uh, places uh, in, in rows uh, for in our mosques. So um, uh, yes, I, I, I see that there is uh, the, the same interest for religious practice, uh, at least what well, concerns my experience uh, in, in Italy. Uh, but uh, uh, so, so, so um, I, I hope this will be also the same case also for synagogues in Italy as well as in Israel. But, uh, of course, I'm, I'm mostly concerned on the level of uh, consciousness uh, uh, when one practices. It should not be only a, a positive habit, but it has to be also a, 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 the, a knowledge of what you are doing and why this symbol has a, a, a added value in your life. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, now it is the floor uh, for uh, Rabbi Shabtaim Avram Akhoi Rapaport, uh, who was for 20 years uh, Rosh Yeshivet uh, Shvut Israel, Kazir Yeshivet de Frat, and uh, since uh, 12 years he has been the head of the Beit Midrash at Barilan uh, University, and where he started is uh, Forum uh, Nitzot. Uh, which pays Torah and the lucky figures with the scientists in different fields, being the year of a long and famous and noble rabbinic tradition. Uh, we can remember also for the webinar that was uh, one of his grand grandfather said, not all that is thought need to be said, not all that is said need to be written, not all that is written need to be published, not all that is published need to be read is also true for webinar, that all what is webinar needed to be followed, but we will follow you with attention and gratitude. So the run floor wrap. Thank you very much. And uh, I have deep roots in Italy. My family uh, came to Venice at uh, 1500 and opened the first Jewish printing press. So it's a wonderful opportunity to sit at home and be in Italy at the same time. <laughs> almost a miracle. Now we are all the people of faith, you know, we believe in miracles and we experience them. Uh, I would like, since I'm in the habit of, of teaching and I'm too old to change my habits, I will uh, try to see some text, but before that, I'm following actually what my brothers Abdullah and Yechia uh, were talking about and Actually, they touched on the points that I wanted to touch. And the thing is, the difference between faith and religion. Uh, organized religion has a problem with the corona, of course, and uh, he has spoke about it very well. 
The question is, uh, the faith question is the added value. What can faith contribute to our handling of the, of our, the situation? Uh, what can faith contribute to someone who wants to bring, who is kind already, who, who knows that we need uh, to show mercy and empathy towards people that, that uh, suffer that, uh, economically and medically? Where does faith come in? And I think it is in the world after the po point that you mentioned in the beginning of this conference, the, what is happening after the corona. Without faith, we'll simply try and uh, Professor Degg will speak, my colleague Alexander will speak about it, the, how did nations and, and the continents uh, responded to uh, plagues. And simply there is a, you throw a stone or you up, you upturn an ant, a nest of ants, and then it's all, uh, they all scramble together and try to build a new order. But with faith, I think we have a direction and I'm following on what the, what the wise words that I heard from Abdullah. And uh, we can, I think we can see some new direction uh, that has, that doesn't have to do only with plain human decency, uh, but also a direction. And I'm going to speak about something which is very universal, and that's economy. The economy, it concerns everyone, and the faith in economics is something which really has to be looked into in, in our time. It, it should be a joint venture of all our faithful, of all our brethren in faith, because there are no walls. We, we interact with each other economically. So we should, and if we are, we agree that we should be directed by faith, then we, uh, we have to cooperate. So I'm sharing the screen with you. And uh, uh, in Psalm, I'm, some text from Psalms uh, 107, Give thanks to the Lord for his good, his mercy endures forever. Forever is a big word. Forever has no beginning and no end. His mercy is always. And then some that lost their way in the barren desert found no path toward the city to live in. They were hungry and thirsty. Their life was ebbing away. In their distress, they cried to the Lord who rescued them in their peril. Now, so I understand that Lord's mercy started at this point, but it was not forever. When they lost their way, there was no mercy of God. And you, Abdullah, I understood you, you were talking about the parable of uh, the prophet. I think that Lord's mercy starts here, when people lost their way, because we are lost in the desert. We are really, everyone is lost in a desert. Everyone acts for himself. E egocentrism is a desert where you exist alone. There is nothing around you. You don't see the people. The people become transparent and you don't see them. You don't know that you are in a desert. So how you'll get out from a desert that you are not aware of. It's so Lord in his mercy makes you hungry and thirsty and you feel that your life is ebbing away. And then all of a sudden you open your eyes and you see that you are alone. It's terrible. You're in distress. You call to, you, you, uh, call to the Lord and he guides them in a, by a direct path. That's it. This, I think, is the main point. When we have a crisis, it's to open our eyes. It serves to us to open our eyes. Now, <clears throat> we all, since we have um, our American colleagues here, of course, they heard of the a foundation of American thinking, capitalism, and, and economics, Adam Smith, who said that a person should try to make the most profit, and but the hidden hand, he doesn't say God, the hidden hand will, will make the cake bigger and everyone's slice will be, will be bigger, everyone will profit from the, from the endeavors to... Uh, uh, to, to uh, help yourself. For this, you need a stable uh, legal system. If you want to have business, 
you need to know, it's very important that you know what is the outcome of, of a business connection. Now, the Talmud in Bava Metzia talks about uh, someone uh, in our day will say he uh, uh, rented a store in a canyon, in a, in a shopping mall, and uh, there were no, he has to pay the monthly rent, and the store was empty because of the corona, because of the pandemic, and he cannot pay the rent. So the first case is that he is talking about grasshopper consumed it, but it's, it's the same idea. Now, if the store, if he did not make money, it, he, he rented the store, it's a normal time, and no one put foot, set foot in the store, there was for some reason, so he still has to pay the rent because the contract has to be, uh, uh, you have to uh, follow your word, you have to abide by your word. And by, by, by the word is a contract and he has to be stable and the shopping mall has to counted when, when it was built, they counted on the rent, without the rent, they'll collapse, there'll be a domino effect, a domino effect of collapsing, the, the mall owners will default to the bank, the bank will collapse, the economy will be hurt. So what do you do if it is not, if it is a regional uh, uh, disaster, if it's a pandemic, if it is something that happens to everyone, which affected all the fields in the area, the cultivator subtracts from the produce he owes as part of his tenancy, meaning you have to, the contract is void and you have to come to some compromise. And this is something very interesting. The, the, even though basically the owner of the shopping mall who rented out the, who rented out the stores has to get his money, something happens that he has to understand that we are, we are having a new game. The pandemic is a game changer. You have to look at it differently. Everyone has to put a sh his shoulder under the burden. It's not the burden of the person who, who rented the store, it's, and it's not the burden of the, of the shopping mall owner. It's, it's a common burden. <clears throat> Maimonides, in the Guide to the Perplexed, talks about charity. The concept of charity, of alms, is, appears is very central to uh, Muslim, Christian, Jewish uh, religions. But Maimonides says something very surprising. Alms or charity in Hebrew is called tzedakah. But the root of tzedakah is tzedek, which is the justice. So, my, so here the translator had a problem that uh, to translate here, tzedakah, he, he couldn't find the word, so he called this righteousness because he could not call it charity, because charity is like loving kindness. So he says, the Maimonides che says that we have two kinds of justice. A justice, which is the law, when you have to abide by the contract, you have to pay. If you made a contract, you have to pay. And tzedakah, which is righteousness, it's, it's a bad translation, but whatever it means, some kind of female, it's a female form of justice. It's a potential justice. It is, it is actually, has, has mercy, object, uh, has elements of mercy, but it's going to become justice. Justice has to evolve. The concept of justice has to evolve. The Adam Smith idea and the idea to the stable uh, legal system. The blindness, the blind goddess of justice has to be blind and has to uh, abide by the law. This is, this is a good beginning, but the game has to be, it has to evolve. And you need, you have to, to understand that in economics, you cannot only think about yourself and about the stability of the system. The faith is the Lord who, the Lord who, 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 uh, who uh, uh, commands the world takes you out of the desert by first showing you that you are in the desert. By thinking about yourself and thinking of a stable legal system, about the blind goddess of law, you are in the, of justice, you are really in a desert. So if it's a regional pandemic, now you know that you get a message. The message is you connect with God and 
you get a message. The message is the game has to change. No blind goddess of justice. You have to open your eyes and, you, and the law says that you have to compromise. You have to find a way to jointly carry the burden and not carry the burden because it's in the benefit of all people that no game theory will tell you it pays for people to compromise because if the owner of the, if the person who rented the store will bankrupt, it'll benefit no one. So it's better to compromise, but it's not the issue. The issue is who called it's Daka because it's right. And, and God shows you what is right and that you are not alone. You are not in a desert. He guides you to the place where you are with other people and you see other people. They're not transparent. Their, their uh, anxiety and their problems, are, you see them and you don't just give charity in order because you are rich and you have, want to have a contract with God like Job did. As long as he gives charity, he's safe. He, he pays he pays his dues in order to be safe. That's nothing. The end of Job will, will show that. The thing is that you, you have to understand what is right. And the right thing is to put your shoulder under the, <clears throat> under the stretcher. Uh, and then when all shoulders are under the stretcher, the stretcher could be born. But this is not the idea. The idea is because it's a game changer and society has to change. And... We should see the pandemic not as a problem that has to be overcome and, and something that we should, should tell our children about it, how we sat together in a Zoom and how we saw each other's face much better in Zoom than if it was alive. If it was alive, we had to hide our faces. Now our faces, oh, no, that, that's not the issue. The issue is that the world changes. It's the, the, the pandemic is a changer, not a problem. Uh, there is another piece of the Talmud that talks about uh, the concept of tzedakah, of, uh, of uh, righteousness, but uh, something, you know, something it has to do with justice, the new kind of justice. If a person, it, it's taken from a, from a verse in Nahum, uh, the first chapter of Nahum, if a person sees that his sustenance is limited, he should use it for charity and all the more so when it's plentiful. And then the, the Talmud brings a parable. The parable is that of a, two sheep that were, that were passing through the river. One sheep was shorn and one sheep was loaded with wool. And they were passing through a river. The sheep that is loaded with wool will drown because the, the wool absorbs the water the sheep that is shorn will, will go through the river. So if, you are, you, if we pass through a river, we should not try to adhere to our wool. Oh, our wool is the most important thing. In time of problem, we should maintain our wool. No one should touch it. This is our main concern. We have an economic problem. There is a problem. So first of all, we come first and we should keep our, like, like uh, uh, <coughs> we should, we should, keep our nuts and all our cheese and not let anyone touch it. This is not the idea. The idea is that if we are shown, if you experience it's tzedakah, if you can change our thinking, if we see other people, and if we, not, we don't contribute alms in order to be, to be okay with God, but uh, we really know that we... The, the sharing of the burden is a way to understand each other, to see their faces, to see their anxiety, to, to feel for them, then we, be, we all became better people. And then we are a shorn a sheep that doesn't care for its wool. It contributed its wool for the common good, but it's, it's a sheep that could go through the river unharmed. Uh, I think this is in economics, the, uh, everything is good in the world of people tell me, you know, if you ask me for, for charity, I'll give you, but I will not have you cheat me out of my, of my money. If a business person will tell you, I, I can give charity as much as you ask me, but don't try to 
mispresent the facts and try to cheat me maybe in business. The, the thing is that economics has to, people see it as something very stable, and when it destabilizes, they try to make it again, bring it again to what it was, so we can continue functioning. I think that the main challenge of, of people of faith is to try to move, to push it. If it's a rock, that is, if we could see economics like a rock that is uh, not stable because it was, uh, it has a, uh, uh, it has a balance, it's not very balanced. So we should not keep it in place with the people of faith who stand together in one side and push it down the hill and get rid of this rock. We need something, we need the grass under the rock and not the rock. And, and this way society can really gain from the pandemic. The pandemic is something that will build society like fire builds the forest. Forest fire is, is a contributing force for the, for the building, rebuilding of the forest. So this is a tremendous challenge. It's a wonderful thing to have you here and listen to you. And thank you for the privilege uh, of, of being able to address you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so now uh, the floor is to Professor Alexander Daig, uh, has been teaching practical theology with a focus on homiletics and liturgy at the Faculty of Theology in Leipzig since uh, 12, uh, 2011. Uh, we will ask his support because we in Bologna, we have taken the opportunity of the COVID uh, to uh, keep the records and, re and the record uh, a few hundreds of homilies uh, during the pandemic uh, because it is a, an extraordinary sample of uh, uh, Catholic predication. Uh, Professor Deig, after studying Protestant theology and du Jewish studies in Erlangen and uh, Jerusalem, uh, was vicar of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bavaria and he was a David pastor in uh, the beginning of this century. Sent, uh, currently is chairman of the liturgical committee of the United Evangelical Lutheran Church of Germany and president of the Societas Omiletica. So Professor Deig, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, dear colleague Meloni. Thanks to all of you for inviting me here and for sharing this time together. Good morning, good afternoon, Bokatov, Ereftov, or whatever and wherever you are. Thanks for the honor of being allowed to speak here. And thank you for giving me a question to speak about, which is surely too big to deal with in eight minutes. So no one will expect me to be comprehensive in any way. And I can just share three points with you. Um, and the good thing to be the last speaker is that everything important already has been said in the last minutes, so I may be quite brief and share my screen with you as well. If this is possible, let me see, because I have a short presentation, which you could maybe see now, right? That's no. fantastic. My theme is the impact of Corona on Western European Christianity, and let me just give you some more or less provocative thoughts and reflections. You know, I'm a Protestant, I'm even a Lutheran pastor and a Protestant practical theologian. But I have to admit, dear colleague Meloni, that one of the most striking pictures I saw in the last month was to see Pope Francis on March 25th, almost alone, on St. Peter's Square in Rome at a rainy evening, sending the blessing Orbi et Orbi at an extraordinary time of the year and then praying in silence for minutes. I think a film director couldn't have thought of a better staging. And in fact, at least here in my German context, there were many film directors and theater directors who congratulated the Pope and said how impressed they were to see what was happening in Rome on this rainy spring evening. The Pope's actions stressed the moment of crisis, showing the world that the situation is severe and it is time for extraordinary action. At the same time, he used quite traditional ritual possibilities, blessing, orbi et orbi, kneeling down in prayer and adoration. He also said some words, but the words were for me, surely not the most striking and impressive sign for me, but the empty square. 
look how it usually looks like when quite a lot of people are there. The question you gave me for this statement is what might be the impact of Corona on Western European Christianity? Is Corona the starting point of intensified religion or of continuing disbelief? I'm sure I won't be able to answer this question. How could I? But I will at least present a thesis and I actually did it already. I would say that if religion does what the Pope did on March 25th, there might be a considerable chance for Christian religion in Western Europe. But if we, especially we, the Protestants, continue to behave as we did and still do in too many places, we might continue to show the irrelevance of Christianity. I wanted to be provocative and maybe have some thoughts about that later on. So here you see the Pope again, and I come to my second point, a chance for religion and how we tend to give it away. Western Europe shows quite an exciting development concerning the role of religion, belief, and Christianity. As you all know, many places in Western Europe, like the part I live in here in Eastern Germany, are among the most secularized places on earth. In my hometown, Leipzig, only about 16% of the people belong to a church or to another religion. If you ask Europeans, do you believe in God, you get something like the following map the percentages showing only those who say that they do strongly believe in God. You see that Germany, again, has the lowest number of people who affirm the question of their religiosity. This is, of course, a result of what we call forced secularity in times of the German Democratic Republic. And still, it is a typical development in Western and Northern European countries. But on the other hand, if you ask people if they are Christians or feel as Christians, you get the following map, which is totally different. Suddenly, we have more than 70% of people in Germany who say that they feel and see themselves as Christian, Christians, 80% in Italy. Of course, this map shows quite a problematic aspect, as many people would say that they see themselves as Christians in order to say that they do not see themselves as Muslim especially right-wing parties try to work on some kind of political and social European identity using the term of the Christian Abendland, the Christian Occident. This is a problem which has to be discussed, but I can't stress it at the moment. What I see here for me now is that there may be a chance for religion in Europe. Most people, even in former German Democratic Republic, are not strict atheists. A lot of people like Christian churches in their cities or villages, appreciate Christian heritage, love Johann Sebastian Bach in my hometown of Leipzig, and see themselves as something like Christians, but what many people lost is their faith in God. Canadian sociologist Charles Taylor, in his monumental work, A Secular Age, I'm sure you all read this wonderful book, would say, well, this is not astonishing at all. He tells the story of modernity and its development and in, on more than 1,000 pages in the German translation. And I just pick out one of his insights, the differentiation of a porous self, which was characteristic in pre-modern times, and a buffered self in modernity. When you live your life as a porous self, you're open and feel open to your environment the aspects you see and many aspects you do not see. You sense that you are a part of creation, dependent on weather and the fertility of the soil. You know that you are vulnerable in many, many ways. Diseases may strike you from time to time, even an epidemic may come. In these times you know, of a poor self, it was absolutely self-evident for people that there are ghosts and demons, angels and spirits, and maybe also God who holds everything in his hands. The way to, mo to modernity, according to Taylor, was away from the porous self to the buffered self. The Cartesian eye became predominant in modern thought. People were less and less affected by the outside world. We have central heating in winter and air conditioning in summer, enough to eat, and medicine is at a level that individual risks, of course, remain. But there is usually no danger of a virus killing thousands and thousands of people all over the world. Vulnerability in modernity is radically limited. 
And the idea that there is something outside affecting you is not the usual way of perceiving yourself. So this is what Charles Taylor said already some time ago. Corona, I would say, makes us feel vulnerable again. There is something outside, something you cannot see, which is radically dangerous and which transforms our lives. In this newly felt vulnerability, some people just want to get back to their normality, to their normal life before the crisis. And Rav Shabtai already said the most important words about this. I don't know if this is really a chance for religion, but what I see is that people start to ask questions again. And I'm sure that our world after the pandemic, if there is a time after the pandemic, will be a radically different world. There are questions, and I'm quite sure that some Christians in my context give the wrong answers or give answers too fast. This is what, what Imam Antipli already said in the very beginning. There are people who instrumentalize and functionalize the crisis because they know too fast what this crisis wants to tell us, and they only instrumentalize it in order to show their own ideas. This is problematic, but there is one other problematic thing. Especially in my Protestant tradition, I think, we are too fast with verbs. We are somehow too noisy. The Protestants are sometimes called the church of the word, but we are again and again the church of too many words. In March 2020, there was this disruptive transformation happening to our Sunday services. We were suddenly in the internet, and this is a great thing, but my impression was many pastors said too much, made too many words, and what they said could easily be expected. They wanted to be helpful, to comfort people, to strengthen confidence, and this is not bad, but it may have been too fast. You already know what a pastor says before he or she opens his mouth. In one of the first analyzes of the crisis, Matthias Hawks said, it is astonishing that God and religions in their well-known and institutionalized form almost do not play a role in this crisis. The churches are empty because they have to be empty, but also the sermons and the internet sound empty in a strange and particular way. When churches only say what you can expect already, when they want to be helpful, they may offer a God who is cheap and some kind of comfort which is cheap and empty. So I'm not sure if the pandemic will really be a chance for religion, but I'm quite sure that we should do three things to gain credibility, and I just name them now and don't say too much about it. First, and this is what many of you already said, practical work, Churches should continue to engage in practical work and practical help, not in words alone. This is a famous picture showing Martin Luther in 1527, when he was among the, the victims of the plague epidemic in Wittenberg. Luther could have left the city, but he stayed there. He wanted to be close to those who might need him. And this is what we should also do. My second point, in my view, a crisis like this is not a time for easy answers, but maybe a time to lament. Too many Christians forget that this lament is a traditional and immensely powerful way of prayer. Lament means that you do not have to have answers, but can address God with all your open questions. If people felt that we are not the agency of quick meaning making and quick comfort, but that we are people who fight with God, suffer with God, ask questions. This could be quite helpful. And third, I think we should ask these questions together with people who lost their confidence and faith in God long ago. In our secularized world, this is the majority, to listen and to be open again. We as a church do not have God and just distribute him. No one has God, but we are searching again and again. I started with the Pope, let me end with the rabbi of my hometown, with Rav Scholt Baller in Leipzig. He became quite famous in times of crisis, not because of intelligent sermons, but just because he did what he always does. He prayed. He did it in his empty synagogue, but streamed, streamed the prayers online so that, that others could participate. People in many places of the world did it, and also his congregation in Leipzig crew. Maybe he is part of the answer what will happen to religion 
in Western Europe and other places. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So we have now time for uh, the question both for uh, Rav Shavitar Rapaport and for Professor uh, Dig. Uh, Yaya Palavicini was raising a question, uh, not so provocative. It is in the chat. He's asking uh, uh, what means uh, and what is the real practice and knowledge of Christianity, of the people identifying themselves as such in Europe, and this issue of religious literacy is an issue that for us uh, uh, in Bologna and Palermo is very important. Francesca Dedu is there, and she's with me, the editor of the report on uh, European religious literacy, and maybe she can uh, enter into the discussion. And so, please, uh, if there are questions for Rav uh, Shavtai uh, and Professor uh, Deig, uh, you, the floor is open. Hilda is asking. The, the, I think that most people in Europe, uh, Jews, Christians, alike, not Muslims, but Jews and Christians know very little about the religion. And religion plays a smaller and smaller role in their life uh, until, until the pandemic. This is what happened. Fewer and fewer Jews belong to organized religion uh, communities, religious communities, and I think the same thing applies to uh, Christian communities. Once uh, Alexander and I tried to make a joint project researching that, the sociology of, the, of this phenomenon, uh, however, this is all good. The, the, I think, I, I believe again that whatever, the, the, whatever direction uh, God di directs the world, it's a good direction. When people know about something and they practice religion and they are very rooted in religion, you cannot change them. They are rooted and they're unchangeable. The, the way to change is through ignorance. You have to pass a phase, a phase of ignorance and then you can, you can build something new. The same, it's the same like the pandemic. It's a sort of an ignorance pan pandemic that takes much longer. And Alexander wondered whether it will be the world after the corona. I don't know if there will be a world after the uh, disregard of religion or uh, uh, not, not practicing religion. But if there will be, it, it must be a better place, better, better world. Thank you. Hey, Malaki, are you? Uh... Yeah. Um, I, I, I couldn't help but contrast the, uh, um, the tone of the student presentation last time with the, uh, with the general tone of the presentations today. Um, the students spoke about the religious experiences and what religious communities did. Uh, at the time of the crisis. Um, the wonderful addresses that we have today um, underline the obstacles to religion and were exhortations for how we can do better. Um, let us um, also emphasize the positive. Could each of the speakers say um, what did the religious community do right during the crisis? Yes. Alexander. Yeah, let me just say one word, Malachi. I, I may be a bit too critical in what I said today, but for me, um, this is really a big question whether we learned something about religion which deals with, well, which deals with faith, as Rav Shabtai said, and with God, which we do not simply have and distribute. But on the other hand, of course, this disruptive challenge in, in March 2020 I think a lot, a lot of religions did really the right thing. They, they were active, um, jumped to the virtual space, to the internet. We had a huge creativity and first research dealing with what happened on the internet and really great forms we saw of lived religion uh, in the virtual sphere, which we will profit a lot in the next years. A lot of people were engaged, but there was also a lot of practical help in the neighborhood by Christians, which has to be cultivated. On the other hand, there were some, well, problematic answers as well, as I told you, and some problematic things. And I think we should balance both of these aspects of 
religion, what it can do good and what the problems are. Thank you. If I may also. Sure. I'm sorry if I also struck a very negative tone, but in every category that I have mentioned that are much more inspiring, beautifully breath of fresh air religious voices uh, than the bad ones. For every religious crazy and nut job who is saying God will, God is angry and destroying us through pandemic, there are so many others inviting us for Tishuwa, Toba, self-examination with the assurance that when we rush to the mercy of God, we will find forgiveness, comfort. And, and I think Pope is one of them. His message has been incredible. Sheikh Abdullah bin Beya, uh, another one. It's incredible how the tone that they were striking was not causing paralysis, but comfort, healing, and further empowerment. It was incredible. And similarly, in the United States, I'm really encouraged by how many white churches are um, really doing the racial examination that they haven't done and, and calling out their troubling past and charting for a better, better future. And also, uh, there are so many religious voices which we have seen again here in every speaker uh, using this pandemic as, as a signs of God, as communication with the divine, uh, using the crisis language and turning it into an opportunity. That's in that area, I'm speaking in general terms, both conceptually and practically, religious communities have done a tremendously wonderful job. I have to, I have to also say, Alexander, uh, as I said it in the chat room, I think European Christians are somewhat confused, if I may say this lovingly and respectfully. Uh, and they can learn, really, I'm serious, how to, uh, one's national identity is important. It's valuable. I care about my Turkish American identity. Uh, and, and but religious, if you don't, if you mix this uh, uninformedly, it will cause only problems. When the Turkish uh, membership to European Union was a real reality, they told a lot of European Union saying like, should Turkey be a member of European Union? A majority in many places says no because this is a Christian club. Then they asked the same people who said no, Turkey shouldn't be part of this because this is a Christian club. When they ask, are you a Christian? They said no. Uh, in the religious sense. I think this is only a manifestation of uh, uninformed, uh, intellectually not very well teased out, what is my religious identity? What is my national and ethnic identity? Jews have been trying to sort this out. Are we a people or a religion for about 5,000 years? I think we can learn a thing or two from our Jewish siblings. Can I Thank say you. something? Yes. Yes, sure. Uh, I just wanted to add something uh, along the lines uh, uh, of um, Abdullah. I think that um, what the, the among the many lessons we learned in the past uh, in the past months, uh, we, we saw that the need of belonging uh, was much stronger than any other need, belonging to a community, belonging to a faith community, belonging to your national community. But then the, the, the thing is that uh, all of these, uh, all of the mentioned bad aspects of, of, uh, of the role of faith during the pandemic are connected to the fact that identity and political identity brought to an extreme poll, extreme um, um, extreme point, also faith and this need of belonging. So very often we, we heard of, I'm not saying something new, but very often we heard uh, politicians bringing uh, the, this political identity with faith to to an extreme uh, to an extreme position. So so the, the the thing is, how do faith communities react to this uh, expropriation of uh, of values, of messages, and 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 how they can invest not just in 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 attracting people or like making feel people more at home uh, within the, the faith communities, but also informing them, <laughs> uh, making them literate about their faith, uh, teaching them about its, its, its messages and, and being critical about the messages that the religion 
and the faith community uh, brings to to the whole world. So, so I think that, that now the, the the real challenge is is here it, it is is how to uh, transform all of this uh, force, all of these uh, interests into uh, becoming a better faithful person, a better believer, a better uh, community member uh, into something um, um, that can make a difference, but in a positive way. Thank you, Francesca. So th there are some questions in, uh, in, in, in the chat and the discussion uh, between uh, Serena Basemur and uh, Abdullah. And uh, still the question of Yaya is, uh, uh, is there. Just to also uh, answer to Malachi's uh, question, to give another concrete example, uh, uh, when uh, the uh, beginning of the pandemic crisis started in Europe, uh, of course, uh, uh, as Muslim uh, scholars uh, at the national level in several European uh, countries, uh, we were, uh, in some times, we were uh, asked to cooperate uh, on how to manage the, uh, the burial of uh, the persons who died uh, um, for, uh, under the virus. And uh, uh, we agreed uh, that there should not be uh, too much gathering, that the washing and dressing of uh, the persons uh, who died uh, should, have, should have been adapted in times and places and circumstances different from the ordinary situations. And so in somehow some guidelines were worked on, on in several European countries. But what happened was that in some towns, uh, in, in order to be pragmatic, uh, they thought to uh, manage all the dead persons from the coronavirus uh, uh, according to uh, cremation. And so we had to react to this uh, pragmatic approach, uh, trying to show them that uh, on one side, we can study how to adapt our rules in rituals, prayers, washing, uh, and dressing the, the Muslim who are dead. But on the other side, we cannot accept that every believer, every citizen has to be treated uh, according to cremation. And this eventually changed. Uh, I'm part of the coordination of uh, Muslim leaders in Europe, and we succeeded in somehow through discussion to change also these uh, uh, pragmatic uh, solutions. So I think through discussion and through a reliable uh, debate, uh, uh, a better knowledge of uh, some situations help also to uh, engage in a better cooperation. My last point would be a, 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 a question to uh, Professor Alexander Dick, who actually uh, mentioned the same situation that also Professor Meloni mentioned. I was in somehow, with due respect to Pope Francis, quite critical on uh, the hyper symbolical uh, uh, interpretation of leaving Pope Francis uh, as uh, a, a sacrifical uh, uh, example of uh, Christian Catholic leadership uh, uh, alone in uh, St. Peter's Square. And uh, my uh, uh, public comment was that I think that it would have been a better, uh, uh, maybe less successful uh, image to have also a delegation of nuns, priests, and believers in St. Peter's Square with the uh, with a security distance, uh, but at, at least symbolically representing uh, the dialogue between the Pope and the Christian believers in this situation. So I'm wondering if this uh, uh, um, if this um, comment of mine can in, and somehow find your agreement as experts also of Christianity. May I just say one word? Thank you, uh, yeah. thank you very much for this comment. I think it's, it's really helpful to hear that. And uh, reflecting the situation end of March again, I would say you're absolutely right. And for me as a Protestant, um, 
to represent church only in one person standing there alone is of course not a very good possibility. And my idea that we share our questions, our lament uh, with, with others would have been a much better staging of religion when you had these people with him around. I think you are right, but um, instead of this, I have to admit that I was deeply impressed. I was really deeply impressed. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, I think we have uh, at least uh, exploited properly our time. Uh, so it is the moment to, to, to try to make a little wrap up of our, uh, of our discussion and uh, to uh, and to do, in order to do this, uh, I'd like to recall uh, to you and to let you know two initiatives that we are taking uh, as uh, a foundation. With, uh, with Francesca Cadedu, we are working to a volume about uh, the historical, pers historical perspective on reactions, uh, on, uh, uh, on pestilence uh, and this type of uh, events starting from uh, uh, biblical commentaries uh, concerning uh, place up to more recent uh, discussion and up to th something that probably uh, may, may, may like because uh, we have left out of the door uh, one uh, big uh, guest tonight that is the science uh, because the lockdown is not a consequence of plague. Uh, the lockdown is a consequence of science because the science told us that this was much better than any other behavior to be, uh, to be taken. And, uh, and so uh, to, to put uh, uh, even the COVID experience in the longer term perspective may be helpful in order to place uh, things. Uh, in the in the St. Peter scene uh, that has been uh, mentioned many times uh, tonight, uh, there have been uh, uh, a few aspects uh, that maybe can uh, be mentioned at uh, closing uh, this session tonight. Already Professor Dig uh, said something about uh, this. Uh, because the, the, the square was empty, but uh, a crucifixion was brought into the square, uh, it was a great danger because it was very old and it became very wet. And, uh, and it is uh, the crucifixion of San Marcello uh, that has been taken into uh, the city in the last plague of the 16th century uh, as a miracle, uh, asking the miracle of the deliver of the plague. And with patience, uh, the miracle came and the plague uh, ended at least uh, a while. And uh, so this plague, this uh, square was uh, uh, empty, but it was uh, filled with the counter-reformation devotional objects and actions. Uh, very clearly, there was uh, no sense of having an ecumenical uh, representation of this because of ecumenical reasons in order to not to uh, drive the Pope to make an ecumenical act without the ecumenical uh, consensus and using in this sense the strength and uh, the eloquence of the papal uh, image uh, that was, as we have seen, very much uh, impressive for many. But I think that uh, next year and in the next uh, events of uh, INIRE, uh, we can probably return on uh, this uh, event and uh, put an eye also on some uh, juridical aspects that uh, Ivan Palavicini uh, was uh, mentioning, uh, the role of public authority prohibiting and admitting different type of social action. Uh, at a certain moment, one night, the Italian prime minister decided which type of rights could be allowed and which type not. That was a, a very tragic moment in our uh, tragic history on uh, religious freedom that is not so large in this uh, country. Uh, 
but uh, uh, this uh, teaches to us that reflection and critical reflection, theological uh, discussion, and uh, the reading uh, of past experiences and uh, theological frameworks is always a useful exercise. And uh, I think we have done uh, something useful, at least for me tonight, and I hope for many of our 40 uh, listeners. Uh, so, uh, uh, as one of my friend of uh, an Italian Jewish journal says, uh, offline at all uh, to everybody. Uh, and uh, I hope we will meet uh, soon. And we are very, uh, uh, we hope uh, very much to welcome you in Palermo very, very soon. So thank you very much. Lucky, do you want to say something to uh, close? No, 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 not at all. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Alberto, for, for, for your wonderful moderation. Thank you to all the participants. I mean, this was a tremendous success, those, those, those two sessions. Please do keep in touch. We have major challenges ahead of us. And uh, next year in Palermo. Sure. Bye. Or next year in Jerusalem. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Assalamu alaikum.